If you even mention the phrase predictive programming, there's already a built-in deflection in academia and other facets of the system to say that this idea is all a conspiracy theory, that it's all based on your confirmation bias that's causing you to put patterns together out of what are likely just coincidences. But there sure are an awful lot of coincidences out there these days, aren't there? So, in order not to sound like a crazy conspiracy theorist, I won't define it for you. I'll let this page on University of Ohio's website do it instead. Predictive programming at its core is a tactic to reduce resistance by introducing concepts that seem far-fetched and continuously reintroducing them to make these concepts appear more likely, or at the very least, acceptable. It's also used as a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy because once an expectation is created, then when these events start to happen, the population may seem more likely to accept the fate. There is also control of imagination because the most commonly used tool in predictive programming is science fiction. By creating these stories, the author can create boundaries of imagination and slowly show what may happen. At the very least, it's putting an image out there that gives a preset idea of what that will be so that if it's encountered later there's already a preset predetermined image that's been stored i'm sure many of you by now are aware of the situation unfolding in east palestine ohio after it was somehow decided following the derailment of a norfolk southern train carrying toxic chemicals on the evening of february 3rd that it would be best to just burn all the chemicals. It smells like a chlorine and leaves like a bad taste in your throat. And this was the water they pulled from around their property after the chemical release. Creating a giant black plume in what officials and reporters are referring to as a controlled release and burn. As if just by calling it that, we're to believe anyone was actually in control over what happens to this random mix of toxic chemicals once it's lit on fire and sent out into the air in its new gaseous form. Where that goes, how much of it will come back down, leach through the soil into the groundwater, and what short and long-term accumulative effects that will have on the health and lives of the people, the food chain, the water supply, things like that. Well, there's the lie. It wasn't a controlled burn, it was an uncontrolled burn. See, I'm a chemical engineer as well, as well as a top health and safety guy. I've got undergraduate and graduate degrees in chemical engineering. In your opinion, why do you believe that it was an uncontrolled burn? Why are you using that terminology when so far everywhere else we've seen that it was a controlled burn? You could go to a place called West Liverpool downriver, and that's where they burn hazardous waste. And in a hazardous waste uh, situation, they very carefully control the temperature and the amount of oxygen so that they get complete combustion, right? It's time, temperature, and, and amount of the air fuel ratio. There's no controlling of the amount of air that gets in there. That's why you saw all that soot. So it's not a controlled burn because a controlled burn would have to be like in a furnace or in your car or some system where you control the fuel and in other words, the vinyl chloride and the amount of oxygen. So they didn't do that. So it's an uncontrolled burn. I've looked through the media from all sides of the political spectrum here to see what is fully being said because it's usually not the same. Despite the fact that a train derailment really shouldn't be a partisan issue. In any given event that rises to the status of national attention, one might think it should be easy to find a base level of agreed upon details, right? But I think we all know that these days, everything can be made into a partisan issue with a little effort, enthusiasm, and spin. He placed someone with deep ties to the chemical industry in charge of the EPA's chemical safety office. That's who you voted for in that district, Donald Trump. That's how our post-truth, post-postmodern media is. The same exact event gets reported on differently depending on which channel you watch, typically slanted and angled along where the political spectrum bias lies. So I'm going to go back and forth between Fox, CNN, NPR, CBS, NBC, etc. to try and get a fuller picture of what people are being told is happening here. But first, I want to start with the basic details of what we we're being told took place from the National Transportation Safety Board. This derailment in Ohio involved a 150 car train, which included 20 cars carrying toxic substances. Of the 38 that derailed, ultimately 11 were carrying these substances, and they included things like vinyl chloride, ethylene glycol monobutyl ether, 
ethyl hexyl acrylate, isobutylene, and benzene. Each one of these has its own lovely array of side effects and health issues it can cause in various forms, and since they all got mixed around and burned together, attributing symptoms like migraines or nausea or difficulty breathing or skin rashes to one specific chemical over another would be kind of tough to do. Early reports discuss the fact that when burned, vinyl chloride produces other potentially harmful gases, including carbon monoxide, hydrogen chloride, and phosgene, which was used in much higher concentrations in the chemical warfare of World War I. It was reported that officials decided to dig a hole, drain the leftover chemicals into it, and burn them, supposedly to avoid a potential explosion. They only evacuated half of the 5,000 people in the village of East Palestine in a one-mile radius. And residents were told they could come back just a couple days later on February 8th. So this all happened within five days. The train derailed. A couple days later, they burned all these chemicals. And a couple days after that, they told everyone it was fine to come back. So dumping the chemicals into a pit together like a big toxic soup and then burning them all into the environment that, that was the big plan. One of the worst ways to um, determine exposure in general is to smell it because if you smell the odor, guess what? You're already exposed. Right? And others, including hazardous materials expert Sil Caggiano, who's been interviewed by several news outlets, as is the custom after an event like this of getting a local person with a good resume that shows he or she is qualified to do media rounds on it, says this was a bad idea that doesn't make any sense to him at all. When they told me their plan, you know, at that point you had a few cars burning. Uh, they had unmonitored hand lines there keeping the tankers cool. And then I find out that they're pulling the unmonitored ta uh, hand lines keeping the tankers cool. And so that's just gonna cause the, uh, the, the tanker cars to heat up, which they did. And then they announced that one was during, you know, very near catastrophic failure. And I said, well, if they don't put water back on it, it's going to continue to heat up and it's going to, what's called a blevy, and it's going to damage other containers. And then I was told, no, they're going to detonate all these cars so that it doesn't happen. I could tell you, uh, Mr. Carlson, I've been looking at rail incidents over and over because in Youngstown, Ohio, there's three rail lines that run through our town. So as a chief and as a uh, instructor, I trained my guys to anticipate stuff. And I would go case study after case study after case study, coming up with different scenarios just to keep it, it going. And I've never once in 39 years ever heard of them blowing up train cars, right. dumping all the chemicals into a trench, and lighting them on fire. I was, you know, I, I was dumbfounded. What Norfolk Southern and the city officials and state officials of Ohio did is literally the equivalent of someone thinking one pump at a gas station might sort of kind of maybe possibly be on the verge of maybe exploding. And so what they decide to do is just go ahead and empty out all the gas onto the ground and light it on fire. Explain to me how that makes any kind of sense. Explain to me why instead of making sure that one did not explode, that putting everything out instead and setting it on fire was the correct course of action because it doesn't make any sense to me. There are also academics and experts from universities all over the country who have descended on this small village in Ohio, and they're doing media rounds as well. You have an article from CNN posted March 1st saying these toxic chemicals could have long-term risks. The highest levels found so far are of a substance called acrolein, which is a pesticide used to control plants, algae, rodents, and other microorganisms. And I noticed in reports like this one, CNN doesn't specifically inform people that acrolein is a pesticide. They don't use that word. Instead, they say it's used to control. But look it up for yourself. I mean, that's what used to control means. It's a pesticide. The way these words are being used seem strategically, psychologically disarming, right? Saying used to control is a lot less alarming then saying the highest levels of any substance found floating around in the air you're breathing is a pesticide used to kill things, which at higher concentrations has been used in chemical warfare in the past. Right? Simply saying used to control, that's a much nicer sounding euphemism, isn't it? And they got this guy whose name is Dr. Albert Presto. His full title is reportedly Associate Research Professor of Mechanical Engineering at Carnegie Mellon's Wilton E. Scott Institute for Energy Innovation. So good luck getting that on a business card. And he's saying, quote, 
It's not elevated to the point where it's necessarily like an immediate evacuate the building health concern, but you know, we don't know necessarily what the long-term risk is or how long that concentration that causes that risk will persist, end quote. Then a little later in the same article, Presto says that residents have been reporting rashes, trouble breathing, sometimes in their own homes. And then he says, quote, when someone says to them, then everything is fine everywhere, if I were that person, I wouldn't believe that statement, end quote. So there you go. We don't really know what, what chemicals are left in the ground that may migrate over time to eventually contaminate a person's well. We have a toxicologist from Vanderbilt University named Frederick Gungrich, probably not saying that right, who says that the burning of the vinyl chloride may have produced dioxins, which are created through combustion, and attached to dust particles in the air. So now you have the EPA ordering Norfolk Southern to test for dioxins, which, which they hadn't been doing. As longtime fans of this channel might remember, we did a mini documentary on the Times Beach, Missouri disaster, which had been sprayed with dioxins for a number of years to control dust without the knowledge of residents, and people began getting really sick. And ultimately, they had to just bulldoze that place to the ground. I mean, I remember driving by the ghost town of Times Beach as a kid and seeing the rows of desolate abandoned houses and being told the story of what happened to those people. It was definitely scarring. As a child, I remember it. Dioxins are not a joke. If they find dioxins, that's it. You don't even want to be there for when they find that, if they find that. That's... If dioxins are even possible at all, it needs to be taken extremely, extremely seriously. Then again, chemicals like vinyl chloride change form when they're released from containment. They turn into different things. So you have to ask, are they even testing for all of the forms of this chemical or just the one form that it was when it was in containment, which is not what it would be after being released into the environment and burnt? We're told that they were an independent testing agency. Before they could enter the premises, they handed us a contract. Um, the contract was essentially, you know, to um, be able to get onto the property, uh, but also at the bottom was a hold harmless agreement. It states that upon signature, the landowner agrees to hold harmless the company for any and all legal claims, personal injury or property damage. She refused to sign. Ohio Senator J.D. Vance is outraged. We, we, we contacted Norfolk Southern right away, and the answer that they gave us, not joking, was that was an accidental indemnification agreement. We didn't mean to give her that one. We gave her the wrong one. For the past month since the derailment, reports have been coming out from all over the area, sometimes miles from the village. Even though North Lima is about 10 miles away from East Palestine, Amanda Brashear says when she went to let her dog out last night at about 10 o'clock, the smell made her eyes water. And she also believes it could be why her chickens are now dead. My video camera footage shows my chickens were perfectly fine before they started this burn. And as soon as they started the burn, my chickens slowed down and they died. If we can do this to chickens in one night, imagine what it's going to do to us in 20 years. Of animals having seizures, dropping dead. I wasn't sure. I didn't put two and two together because we were told it was safe. And then um, I had another one that I found a few minutes later. Um, you can see that his legs are just not working right. This is infuriating and it's sad. It was two days after the detonation. Being found dead, dead chickens, dead foxes, dead deer. Reports of thousands of dead fish. All coming from the one creek that's coming from the wreckage. Uh, that fish in this one is actually probably about a foot long, so it's not just the little ones. And then you see a bunch of little ones scattered around it. Little beaver runs into big beaver, runs through our state park, and there's dead fish everywhere. People have been throwing rocks in local creeks to film the latent rainbow chemical sheens that pop to the surface. Wow. Look at all that. Look at it. It's all in the bottom of the creek bed. You scrape the creek bed, it's like chemical is coming out of the ground. Can you show, can you come here? And, and, and let me just show this to people. I don't know if you're going to see this on the camera, but watch this. Just see that chemical pop out of the creek. This is disgusting. And the fact that we have not 
clean up the, the, the train crash. The fact that these chemicals are still seeping in the ground is an insult to the people who live in East Palestine. And now Aaron Brockovich is there doing a town hall. The Aaron Brockovich, not Julia Roberts, the actual Aaron Brockovich. But please understand, in that moment, it might have been safe. But tomorrow, that might not be the circumstance. And this is what we've learned over and over again. These chemicals take time to move in the water. Who's maybe the only person I've seen at this site who seems to actually be listening to people? rather than just telling them everything is fine over and over, like a used car salesman trying to sell someone a rusty pinno that might catch fire every time they engage the brakes at a stoplight. Uh, it came out today that literally Ohio law enforcement uh, put Aaron Brockovich on a terrorist list. Uh, this is not The Onion. I am not making it up. It's the Yahoo News story. So Aaron Brockovich was put uh, on a uh, law enforcement, put her on a special interest terrorism threat for her activism in East Palestine. So it was not even a month after the event happened that the state of Ohio had already passed a $12.6 billion transportation budget, reportedly in response to the train derailment. So that was pretty fast. And speaking of fast, senators have also already introduced a bipartisan Railway Safety Act of 2023. Meanwhile, the railroad company just now a month later has gotten around to deciding that yes, it will go ahead and remove the contaminated soil under the train tracks where this thing happened. But they still haven't officially, at the time of writing this report, discussed buying people out or helping them move out of there. Has there been any talk about relocating people? There is not. Norfolk Southern set aside $1 million for the thousands of people who are basically homeless unless they want to stay in a place where they don't feel safe to breathe the air and drink the water. One million dollars. They're worth 53 billion dollars and last year alone they spent 4.23 billion on share repurchases. So the one million earmarked for the community represents 0.02 percent of the money they spent on stock buybacks just last year. Good thing the EPA ordered the same company who caused the problem to be entrusted with cleaning up their own mess. I mean, who wouldn't trust them, right? I want to begin today by expressing how deeply sorry I am for the impact this derailment has had on the residents of East Palestine and the surrounding communities. Zero recourse behind any of it. There has been zero recourse for Norfolk Southern on what they chose to do with those chemicals. It basically lets you know that people don't matter. The people in East Palestine, Ohio do not matter. The people in surrounding areas of East Palestine, Ohio do not matter. If I was to start a bonfire, y'all, if I was to go in my backyard and start a bonfire, I could get fined by the city for it. There are rules to what you and I can do in our own backyards with just a small little bonfire that's contained in this itty bitty little spot, yet Norfolk Southern can willingly release chemicals into the soil of a residential area and light it on fire. And then all they have to do is go before Congress and say, I am deeply sorry for the pain and uh, inconvenience we have caused the people of East Palestine, Ohio. And that's it. Speaking of, Norfolk Southern CEO Alan Shaw was a no-show to not one but two town hall meetings with the freaked out residents who really just wanted the chance to confront him face to face, who just want him to see their faces and know that they are human beings who are suffering. To get answers to questions that have not been answered. Questions like, why does it appear that getting the track open back up was seemingly prioritized over the well-being of the people in the town? That has now been potentially destroyed by this failure. At the second town hall, one resident reportedly yelled, don't lie to us at an EPA regional administrator. Residents also questioning why Norfolk Southern CEO Alan Shaw failed to show up. Where's Alan? Who reiterated once more that the air was safe, that the soil and water are safe, like the safe word is safe, and if they just keep saying safe enough times, it might make anyone actually believe them. And you have residents of this village complaining of all kinds of symptoms and illnesses, 
And many people are afraid to stay in their homes and that they don't know, again, the long-term health impacts of a more chronic low-level exposure to these things. You know, exactly like the kind of exposure a person would be exposed to if they continue to remain living in their house in that place. They're saying, oh, our team said they didn't test anything in the air. Well, let's talk about the soil. Let's talk about this, this residue. Why are people getting sick if it's, if it's fucking safe? Why are they getting sick? You don't believe it? Yeah, no, absolutely not. I definitely don't trust Nor Norfolk or the team that they hired. I don't think it, they should have been given the ability to hold the reins on the narrative. Then it came out that the train company was shipping contaminated materials, water, and debris from this site using ordinary tractor-trailer trucks to places across the country like Texas and Michigan, quietly contracting with other companies to dispose of these contaminated materials, and no one informed the cities themselves that this material was on its way there. In other words, this toxic stuff was being trucked all over the country, and no one told city governments or the public to be expecting that stuff at their door. Early 30 seconds ago, we were on the phone talking with both the governor's office and the EPA, and we got word, not official word, uh, but word from folks that trucks were on their way here uh, with the toxic waste, both the, the liquid waste that would be um, deep well injected. And Wayne County government, not knowing that they're coming, which way they're coming, uh, how safe the trucks are that are coming uh, is something that has got us all very, very irritated. Uh, nobody more irritated than me. Uh, it sounds, for all intent and purposes, like we've been sandbagged. It's not like the trucks can't have wrecks too. Like this one that crashed in Arizona a couple weeks after the Ohio derailment and forced evacuations within a half mile of the site as liquid nitric acid was leaking out on Highway 10 southeast of Tucson in a nasty looking bright orangey red cloud. But back to Ohio, the latest report I saw before I had to call it to finish this video is that heavy rains in the area caused a dam designed to prevent the toxic water contamination in East Palestine from spreading to be compromised. New fears in East Palestine from residents who tell me rain breached a man-made dam constructed by Norfolk Southern after the massive train derailment. And residents now fear the contaminated water will seep into their homes and businesses. Forcing contaminated water in these photos to flow back into the creek and flood the area of Main Street. Eric Jake Koza tells me by telephone from East Palestine, he's frightened to think about what could happen if toxic water seeps into neighboring homes and businesses. I'm feared that now the chemical is in the ground, it's gonna leach towards the, you know, the water ducts, um, you know, our, our aquifer for drinking water. I'm concerned that the park is now contaminated. Koza's family has been diagnosed with chemical irritation or rashes on their skin. Now he says with the breach of the man-made dam, there's an odor in the air again. I have fear. I've had fear and this just put the anxiety over the top. The story's headline is, new level of fear as makeshift dam is breached in East Palestine. Now, I'm admittedly not an expert in anything related to biology, chemistry, or medicine. I am, however, a concerned person with critical thinking skills and functioning eyeballs who can read. I can't tell anyone else what to do, but I can say that if it was me, even if I didn't have a dollar in my pocket and had to sleep in my car, I would be getting the hell out of there for right now. I mean, I'm watching some of these interviews with townspeople and the things that are being said, and it's like watching a slow motion horror film. Would you move back if you were in one of these homes and you were told it was safe? That would depend. If I had a young child, or if my wife was pregnant, uh, that might put another level of what I'm going to do about this. And the bottom line here that everyone on all sides keeps mentioning is the bottom line, the money. This is all about the money, like it always is. Profits, not people. Property, not people. You're on call 24-7, 365. It seemed like the last several years that things got worse. Uh, it all had to do with this precision scheduled railroading that they came up with a few years ago. Cutting jobs, cutting costs, doing everything they can to save a dollar. Or people feeling trapped there, not physically being caged or put on house arrest and forced to stay, but by feeling financially unable to afford to leave. But by the same token, I need to also consider what my 
what my resources are. I mean, can I really afford to spend a week or two more in a hotel and not be in my home? Maybe I work in that town. Do I really have the opportunity to leave my job? Um, do I have another place or not have another place to stay? For various reasons. I, mean, I personally would say no things should be worth more than people's lives, but that's just me. I'm someone who's been pretty disgusted by how this system always, almost without exception, seems to put profits over people. When precision scheduled railroading came out, they gave us a list of priorities that we were to work by. Safety's fourth. What came ahead of safety? The almighty buck. With the cuts in staffing, there's fewer car inspectors. It used to be the car inspectors would have five to eight minutes to inspect a car. Now they're down to something like 30 seconds a car. So the company was prioritizing profits over safety in, yes. in your experience? Yes. Property over people, things over human souls. Take steps to start doing things in a safe manner that we used to do and quit worrying about the damn money. The total dehumanization of humanity in this post-postmodern era is just, it's just utterly repulsive to me. And as we continue to watch ecological disasters unfold, it seems like they always follow a similar pattern. There's always the same delay, always the same vague answers, always the, the immediate promises that everything is fine, just immediately it's safe. The government has repeatedly, not only since this derailment on February 3rd, but like historically, um, never really dealt directly um, and told the full truth about health risks that are faced by local communities that get hit with these major industrial accidents. I mean, the company detonated cancer-causing chemicals over a million pounds creating a mushroom cloud of poison. The governor of Ohio, just a few days after this disaster, recommended people go back. There was no scientific basis to make that recommendation. It was more of a political decision to manage the public relations fallout. Top government officials have spent the week spreading the message that the water in East Palestine is safe to drink, even drinking some themselves on camera. Right. Cheers to cheers. There you go. I just drank a full slug off of uh, river water. We put iodine in it, make sure there's no GRD. Don't ever drink river water. I want to let you know this water, the metals are at a pre-incident pre event. Eight months later, we're going to pull some sediment samples. While the water appears to be back to normal, I'm looking at this orange color that you see right here. State officials say it's not because the sediment is still contaminated. It is. There you go. You know, generally I have not been doing stunts here, but you know. <laughs> So one final question. You represent Flint, Michigan. Are you confident that the water there is now safe for residents to drink? No, I don't think we can trust it yet. It is getting better. We have to acknowledge that. We, we should, by the end of July, certainly by the end of the summer, uh, have been able to replace all those lead service lines that have been the source of the, the poisoning. Uh, but people don't trust it yet. They were told the water was safe once before when it really wasn't. So I think until those lead lines are gone. They were told the water was safe once before when it really wasn't. Because as we all know, taking a swallow of this water or even a Hickenlooper chug or maybe that Obama non-sip, whatever that was, that's totally equivalent, 100% the same as continued exposure to living in that town drinking that water, bathing in that water, cooking with that water, doing your laundry with that water, giving that water to your pets and your livestock, watering your lawn, food you're growing. That's all exactly the same. It's totally equivalent. That continued exposure all the time in every facet of your life is totally the same to standing in a room and taking a swallow. That's, that's completely the same. Why don't people trust this? And as my friend Amy said, <laughs> They really are being rather insulting, aren't they? Because 
it's like it's like they assume people don't understand a little bit of, of exposure is nothing really i mean it's not good for you but the continued exposure like come on listen they just think people are stupid the same hollow peal of an empty can echoing as it's kicked down the road the same spiritless reassurances that really fail to reassure anyone again and again and that's the thing about our brains If we don't personally think something is safe, it doesn't really matter how many times someone else tells us that it is. You could tell yourself that you are safe all day, but if you don't actually feel that safety inside, those words are basically meaningless. I did to have my air tested whenever they said that it was safe to return back to your home. Well, I had a company called CTEH come and test my air, and they walked all throughout my home and detected less than 0.1 VOCS uh, ppm, which is considered to be safe and nothing in the air. Well, while they were leaving, I stopped them because a train was coming by and I asked them to test the air while the train was coming by and they detected over 60 uh, VOCS ppm. So I have an eight month old baby and you're gonna say that every time a train comes by, those chemicals are being kicked back up into the air. I have no idea what we could be breathing in every time a train comes by and these trains come by hundreds of times in a day. So I just feel like I'm being lied to and I feel like it's not safe. As a society, we come together to pretend in these situations. As if we don't want to admit what's actually going on to our own selves. It doesn't matter who the guy up at the podium is in his personal life. Someone who goes home, has dinner with his spouse and children, watches TV, has hobbies like stamp collecting and fantasy football or playing the harmonica or whatever. When that person is up at that podium with an American flag pin stuck in his lapel, he is now a mouthpiece of an entity. And his job is to deflect blame and reassure people that everything's fine. While kicking the red, white, and blue can down the road because the truth is they can't possibly know the future with this situation. And corporate mouthpieces work the exact same way. And really, again, how could they claim to know with any degree of certainty what the long-term fallout of this will be? They don't know. It's not like scientific studies have ever been done with this exact mixture of chemicals at these exact concentrations when combined in and burned to see what the long-term ecological effects and impacts of that will be on on living things, on human beings and farm animals and the water and all that, they don't, they don't know. It would be impossible for them to know. And that's the other part of the bottom line. It's people just doing their jobs. No matter what, because like everyone else, they have bills to pay too. Like when this CNN reporter tried to ask the workers cleaning up the site about the white tubes they put in the creek. Some of their questions unanswered. We found getting information just as challenging. Can okay, you tell me, are they pumping water out or are you uh, pumping water back in? Yeah. Talking to the guys up at the top of the hill, sir. We're, we're just grunts. We're just trying to get a sense of what, what those pumps are. Can you just someone just... Norfolk Southern can tell you everything. That's the hotline. They can tell you everything. You realize people are calling this number and no one is getting back to them. That, we're just told to direct people to that number. We're just told to direct people to that number. But see... Those guys are just doing what they were told. They're just doing their jobs, just deflecting questions to a number which, like them, also fails to give anyone any answers. Just doing their jobs. They have a job to do, and they're just doing it. And how that's working out is, now CNBC is reporting that those workers sent in to do the cleanup at the site who were just doing their jobs have written a letter to federal officials complaining they too have now fallen ill, complaining of symptoms like migraines and nausea, complaining that this is because they were not given enough respirators, not enough eye protection, or protective clothing, as well as a general feeling of a lack of safety at the site overall, which the train company, like everything else, of course denies. Where have we heard this before? We've heard this before so many times.
But trust is supposed to be earned, right? I'd just as soon trust a random stranger with a gleam in his eye lurking in a dark alley in the middle of the night than one of these just doing my job people who are literally paid to kick cans down the road. I'm looking forward to answering questions. Just one quick question. Thank you. We're just going to run in. But again, that's a decision everyone has to make for themselves. Personally, I'd say this century has illustrated in great detail over many, many events that hardly anyone in power is really trying to earn trust anymore these days. This train derailed on February 3rd, and it wasn't widely being reported on video. Specifically on video, it was not widely being reported on video at the national level until days afterwards. The first stories really mentioning this derailment at all were out of AP and CNN, and that wasn't until the following day after it happened. Just a few digital paragraphs. I personally didn't hear about it at all until the 10th when my daughter texted me to say a train derailed and her friends near there thought it was weird it wasn't garnering more media attention. And she's not wrong. If you, if you look through the video news reporting on this at a national level, there was definitely a delay between the event happening and video reporting of this event. Even Google Trends shows this event was not known widely on the day it happened. I actually saw people on Twitter debating if it really happened at all because they had received push notifications from the New York Times about the Super Bowl, but nothing about East Palestine. The company actually had another train derail in Springfield, Ohio on March 4th, but reports say this one was non-hazardous materials. So at least there's that. But also, apparently a dump truck slammed into a stopped Norfolk Southern train in Cleveland and killed the conductor who was standing outside of it. And that was March 7th. And that, that situation hasn't really been explained yet. So there's a lot going on in Ohio with a train company that I will admit I hadn't even really ever heard of until last month. But wouldn't you know it, the new safety plan that the company has put forward involves acceleration of automated safety inspections. Automation. For issues which rail workers have warned may largely not be found by the technology the company is pushing to use. Norfolk Southern happens to be the first railroad company to speak out on autonomous tech in the railroads. And there were articles coming out five years ago now about this company's claims that federal regulations were impeding automation of the railroads and that this tech will help reduce human error by minimizing the number of people around equipment, thus reducing accidents and injuries. There's just so many coincidences. But when the company burned these chemicals, it produced an iconic cloud and pictures were taken of this that actually kind of look almost like a nuclear bomb was detonated over an American city. So it's kind of hard to believe that the mainstream media wouldn't pick that up and take off running with it like a constipated wiener dog, like they normally do for anything they can use to drum up group energy. White noise is defined as a mixture of random noise extending over the entire audible frequency spectrum, with approximately equal intensity at all frequencies used in certain experiments, as in psychology, to prevent subjects from hearing meaningful sounds. In other words, white noise is used to block signals from being coherently heard so they can be translated and understood by our brains. It's a background sound that effectively drowns out all other meaningful noises. For me, the idea of white noise immediately calls to mind this media-saturated time that we live in where we're just drowning in signals and, and we can't seem to hear the ones that are actually relevant to our lives. A constant bombardment of tragedy and violence and death and explosions and, and corruption and other events. And uh, there's so many of them that we become desensitized to it and don't know where to put our focus. So unless it happens to us locally, it's hard to even focus in on what the real significance is of what's happening anywhere and everywhere at any given point in time. It just, 
becomes a deluge of randomly connected things and we kind of lose trace of, of what would be important, I guess. And at certain times during major disasters, we could kind of focus in and see the layers of deception and, and just manipulated pseudo reality that we live in. Something else came out at the time of this train derailment. Reports that people who were evacuated from their homes in East Palestine because a train derailed and released toxic chemicals were also extras in a film where they had to be evacuated after a train derailed and released toxic chemicals. How long after the crash on the third did you think of, of white noise? You were an extra in this movie. Yeah, probably the fourth. Uh, whenever it started coming out that there was more than just a fire train derailment, and it was more about the chemicals, it was like, oh, this is kind of uncanny. That film is titled White Noise, and it's based on a 1985 Tom DeLillo novel of the same name. White Noise was premiered at the Venice International Film Festival on August 31st, 2022. It showed in a few select cinemas in late November and wasn't released on Netflix streaming platform until December 30th. The film was shot almost entirely in Northeast Ohio and follows a family as they live through an airborne toxic event. A distracted truck driver grasping for a bottle of Jack Daniels fails to see a train crossing and slams into it. And the train is carrying hazardous chemicals and the whole thing explodes sending a black plume of smoke up into the air and triggering an evacuation due to the release of deadly chemicals. Aaron and I had just happened to watch this movie a few weeks before I found out about the derailment in Ohio, but it was the first thing that popped into my head when my daughter texted me. Because what are the odds of that? There are scenes in this movie that you could match up to the reality of what happened in East Palestine and if it weren't for the vibrant colors of it being a film and its quirky dialogue and famous actors, you actually might not be able to really tell the difference. If you have not evacuated, please leave the area. Uh, right here, three dead deer uh, within 50, 50 yards of each other. It's eerie. Okay, so I didn't have time to do a whole thing here. I'm just adding this in after the fact, but I did get a copy of this book finally. Um, have not had a chance to read it, but I have skimmed through it. And this morning, March 9th, apparently another Norfolk Southern train has derailed in Iron City, Alabama. So I don't know what the odds of that are, but in this book, in this here, in this book, page 159, I don't know if you can see this, I'll try to do this this way so I can just do it really quick, where they talk about arriving in Iron City. The cloud continues to travel west as residents are now being asked to relocate to Iron City, where local businesses have opened their doors to shelter evacuees who have been further displaced from their homes. Yeah, so I don't know what's going on right now, uh, but how many coincidences are there? I mean, literally how many are there? I get it, it was Iron City, Ohio, this is Iron City, Alabama, but come on, this is a little bit weird. You have to admit, even people who are completely skeptical and say that everyone is a conspiracy theorist who even supposedly finds these coincidences a little eerie, you have to admit, even you, this is weird. It's weird. I can't explain the fact that a 2022 movie based on a 1985 book set in Ohio and filmed in Ohio about a toxic chemical spill following a train derailment bled so heavily over into the reality that occurred six months after the film's release but I can tell you, it isn't the first time that this has happened. A 1979 film called China Syndrome, about a reporter who discovers safety violation cover-ups at a nuclear plant. Um, the title, referencing the idea that a nuclear meltdown at a power plant could cause reactor components to melt all the way through the Earth to China, was released in theaters just 12 days before the Three Mile Island incident in Pennsylvania. 
So not even two weeks after they put that movie in theaters, you had that hap- that event happen. The first episode of The Lone Gunman, an X-Files spinoff show, was about a conspiracy to hijack a plane and fly it into the World Trade Center. We know it's a war game scenario, that it has to do with airline counterterrorism. Which aired about six months before 9-11 happened. In the Nicolas Cage film Knowing, there's a TV news report about an oil rig exploding in the Gulf of Mexico. An explosion on a soon-to-be-decommissioned oil rig triggered a fire which burned for three hours before it was extinguished. Knowing was released on March 20th, 2009. On April 20th, 2010, an oil rig indeed exploded in the Gulf of Mexico. Well, the oil rig that exploded is incredible video. That oil rig has now sunk. 8,000 barrels of oil leaking per day. The Deepwater Horizon oil spill, the largest marine oil spill in history. But remember, predictive programming is a conspiracy theory. So if I say the media presents an idea to an audience that at the very least will be matched up to reality should that event occur there in the future, it's because I like to wear tinfoil hats. But seriously, it's like alien invasions. If you took a poll on what an alien from outer space looks like, you're probably going to get the same basic concept of green humanoids with bug eyes that we've been conditioned to expect for decades and decades from more people than not. But where does that image actually come from? Does it come from us? Some archetype hidden in our collective unconscious? Or was it put there by modern media? Either way, we all know what that version of aliens looks like, even though the only alien invasions on that score have been on TV and in the movies. I've said it before on this channel, but your brain can only be truly shocked by new information once. Once you're acquainted with an idea for the first time, once it's in there, you now have a reference for that event that will no doubt be activated once you hear about something like it happening again. Your imagination and expectations, your thoughts and feelings, they're all now programmed and preset. It doesn't mean you have to suddenly act like you're a character in that movie, but it's not like you're completely astounded when it happens because you already have a whole idea baked in. I mean, I did. When I heard about Ohio, the first thing I thought of was the movie White Noise, because I had just watched it two weeks before it happened. Now, what I can tell you is that the Bureau of Transportation Statistics has recorded 54,570 train derailments in the U.S. between 1990, when they first began collecting this data, and 2021. Which means, on average, there are over 1,700 train derailments in this country each year, which works out to at least four per day. I had no idea it was so many. I mean, when I saw those statistics, it kind of makes me wonder how we've gotten to the point that we are without more East Palestines popping up in the news than we have. Still, though, I, I cannot imagine how it would feel to be an extra in a film or have to act like I'm evacuating my home after a toxic chemical cloud following a train derailment, only to turn around and get evacuated from my actual home after a toxic chemical cloud following a train derailment. I mean, the word surreal doesn't really cover it. There's been a lot of hate for this movie, some of it regarding the situation in Ohio after the fact. But again, I watched it before the derailment, and the first thing I thought of when I watched it was actually how some people reacted to COVID. Despite what you believe on what's going on in the space between life imitating art these days, it seems like everything's inverted. There are some deep observations in this film that stand out and are worth discussing. Now, admittedly, I have not read this book, so I can only refer to the film. But... My takeaway from this film is that it's all about our society's horror and conversely obsession with death. Death lingers in almost every scene of this movie like a dead elephant in the room. Our inability to deal with death, our attempts at coping with the reality of death, the way we interact in this society being based upon it, the economics of death, how people do anything to push away the inevitability of it, 
and how this fear is not only used to control us, but ultimately how we use this fear to control ourselves. Oftentimes, allowing our fear to scare us into making decisions that can destroy us, or even lead to the very thing some of us want so desperately to avoid confronting. This is a two hour and 16 minute long film, and not counting deadly or deathly, the words death, dead, dying, and die were used 82 times, which is an average of less than every two minutes. But that layer is buried underneath this omnipresent information that's just bombarding us from all sides at all times till it becomes basically like a white noise. And it becomes very hard for us to pick out which signals are real. And a lot of these signals come in the form of words. And what are words? They're symbols. Information source selects the desired message out of a set of possible messages. The transmitter changes the message into the signal, which is sent over the communications channel to the receiver, where it is decoded back into the message and delivered to the destination. But the concepts that these words unleash in our minds can sometimes be more powerful than our own senses in how we actually perceive the world around us that we exist within. The most fact of communicating as communication of smallpox, of a secret, of power. Two, intercourse by words, letters, or messages. And how words and the concepts they unleash in our minds are more powerful than our own senses and how we perceive the world we exist within. So there's going to be some spoilers here. So if you haven't seen this movie, perhaps you want to turn this video off right now, come back and watch the rest of it afterwards. The movie opens by breaking the fourth wall, something that happens subtly throughout the film. As Don Cheadle, who plays my favorite character in the film, Murray, walks us in his college class through a montage of movie car crashes. He refers to this mashup of creation through destruction as American optimism, which cuts right to cars on the road to the college where main character Jack, J.A.K. Gladney, played by Adam Driver, teaches advanced Hitler studies at, that's the class he teaches, alongside Murray, who specializes in living icons, but wants to focus his academic efforts on Elvis, who is obviously dead. Jack is married to Babette, and they have four kids. There's a deep point that's almost continuously made throughout this film about the power of words, the power they hold over us. After the crash and subsequent derailment, for example, there's a whole interplay about what symptoms people should have based on what the radio says, and it keeps changing as the authorities keep changing the classification of the event from a feathery plume to a black billowing cloud to an airborne toxic event. At one point, the older son Heinrich says one of the daughters is showing outdated symptoms when she runs to the bathroom to yak. This comes up again and again throughout this movie. After the family gets to the evacuation site, Jack is talking to a guy with an armband from something called Simuvac which stands for Simulated Evacuation. Are you saying you saw the chance to use the real event in order to rehearse the simulation? And Jack, who had to get out to get gas, was exposed to the cloud for two and a half minutes. He asked this guy, am I going to die? And the guy is typing things into the computer, which he doesn't let him see. But it's very official because he's got the computer and he's typing things, right? And the guy says, not in so many words. And Jack responds, how many words does it take? And there's been research that's been done into various religious cults where people are seemingly killed by curses, which are really just words backed by fervent belief in the target of the curse. I mean, we know words can definitely cause fear, especially depending on who is saying those words. How authoritative are they? But can words 
if believed deeply enough by the people who hear them, actually kill. The Simiovac guy tells Jack, I wouldn't worry about what you can't see or feel. Later, Jack tells his oldest daughter the power of suggestion makes some people sick and other people well. And if he thinks a shady experimental medication is going to help him out, it will because he believes it. So just like placebo effect. I have a PhD in organic chemistry, but people like me end up in the pharmaceutical industry. So, so I worked for one of the world's largest pharmaceutical companies developing drugs for cardiovascular disease and for cancer. Uh, and I, although I loved doing what I was doing, I loved the science of it, but what fascinated me more so, I would say, was what happens when you test the drugs. So, so let's say in a typical trial, you might give 100 people a drug to show that it works. So you've also got to give 100 people a placebo for comparison purposes. And you might get, say, 75 people improving on a drug. But it's not uncommon to get 40, 50, 60, 70, 74, 75, sometimes even, also improving on the placebo because they think they're getting a drug. And I thought, whoa, it's amazing. Where the placebo effect, the result of positive thinking, the important question is this, what is the consequence of negative thinking? A nocebo, negative belief, can actually cause any illness and can cause death just because you believe that. Interestingly, the officials in the media keep changing the name of the event to more serious names and the side effects keep changing. But once the black billowing cloud is upgraded to an airborne toxic event, the side effects become heart palpitations and a sense of deja vu. Heinrich specifies, it affects the false part of the human brain. Deja vu is featured multiple times throughout the film as if these major events are preceded by a sense of having lived through these exact moments before they actually happened. Just like the extras in White Noise, who were later evacuated from their homes in East Palestine under eerily similar circumstances in real life. Deja vu. But the question is, what gives that sense of deja vu? Is it because we're constantly watching this stuff in movies and on television all the time, so when something happens to us in our lives, there's no way for it to be new to us? At one point during the evacuation, the younger daughter, Steffi, is looking at the cars they pass and says, I want to know how scared I should be. She's looking for external cues to interpret. Everyone in this family except the smallest has learned fear and seems really concerned with being afraid of various things throughout the entire movie. We're trained as children not to express our fears. And by the time we're adults, we've thoroughly learned to push those feelings away, to push them down, laugh them off, ignore and avoid them. To eat them, we eat our fear. That's what we do in this society. We're also trained to take on external situations that don't actually affect us personally and internalize them as well. There's a whole scene after the family gets evacuated to a secondary location farther away where a man starts angrily yelling about how the media isn't covering the event. Sound familiar? This thing happens so often that nobody cares. Just like what people perceive the night the train derailed in Ohio. Do they think this is just television? Don't they know it's real? He says with a television on his head. Is it fear news? The answer to that question is generally yes. This development now brings in a whole new element of fear. Anyone can attest who has been raised in the television era and especially since the 24 hour news cycle came into existence that fear is most definitely news. This is part of why we stopped watching television news in our house. It just came out last week that former Secretary of Health in the UK, Matt Hancock, asked when the government should deploy the next variant to, quote, frighten the pants off the public and discussed what will get the proper behavior change they wanted, scaring the public into compliance with the ever-changing rules of the lockdown over there in the UK. Something that's been referred to by the media as Project Fear. If you do a search for Ohio train fear, lots of headlines are about how afraid and anxious East Palestine residents are in the wake of this event. 
Now to the crisis of confidence in East Palestine, Ohio, after that train derailment and toxic spill nearly two weeks ago. The image is still causing concern, though officials say the air is now clear. The image is still causing concern. The image is still causing concern. A plethora of headlines amplify residents' fear, worry, anxiety, mistrust of officials. Fear is most definitely news. But how often do people stop to ask what effect that fear has on the people who consume that news? I mean, there's, there's really no doubt that we are living in a time of near-constant media-driven fear. <laughs> I mean, when there isn't a local event for them to harp on, there's always war and potential war and climate change and natural disasters to fall back on. In the film, one of the side characters talks about how disasters are actually being used to break up the continuous stream of information that we're bombarded with in our technologically driven world. In a March 1, 2023 column titled The Rise of the Biosecurity Complex, Thomas Fozzi points out that crisis has become such a pervasive and all-encompassing feature of our lives these days that several critical scholars have posited that under neoliberalism, crisis has become a full-blown method of government. After all, he writes, crises are just as much rooted in some objective reality as they are the product of a narrative construction. An event only becomes a crisis once it is officially classified as such by authorities. In this sense, crisis as a mode of government goes beyond the shock doctrine of Naomi Klein, for example, but he says should be understood as the constant invoking of crisis itself, regardless of whether the situation at hand actually deserves the label or not. Fozzie points out that Western elites needed a way to get the majority to accept being ruled by an increasingly small minority, and the answer they came up with was fear, giving birth to a new paradigm he calls full-spectrum preparedness. The definition of the word security was eventually expanded to include virtually every area of human life. He evaluates what we all lived through these last few years and asks how much of the future is now being hypothesized by preparedness or scripted by it. Then he concludes, Ultimately, the issue of foreknowledge is overshadowed by an even more daunting truth. We have entered an era in which Western establishments need to constantly invent new nightmares to maintain their power. And when enough people with enough power start to dream the same nightmare, it's only a matter of time before it comes true. People will fear when they're told to fear. Except for the collective trauma. The grocery store links different parts of this movie together. After all, it is the one place where the majority of society is sure to go, regardless of religion or political affiliation, etc. I mean, we all gotta eat. The supermarket is the main place we get our nourishment from. Murray says, Everything is fine, and will continue to be fine as long as the supermarket doesn't slip. Everything is fine and will continue to be fine as long as the supermarket doesn't slip. I might not have understood the depths of that statement until the last decade or so, but I've seen this for myself. I've seen media-driven fear turn into hysteria in a supermarket aisle. I've seen whole supermarket aisles be cleaned out. After the media warned in Austin, for example, there would be a tenth of an inch of ice on the road. A tenth of an inch of ice was all it took, and the way that that was reported was so frightening for some people that they completely cleaned the store out. And we did a report on that. You can go watch and see for yourself. It was insane. The response did not match the so-called threat. And in fact, there didn't end up being any ice at all. So it was not even, it didn't even end up happening. But you couldn't buy soup. You couldn't buy bread. The meat was gone. I mean, it was crazy. And that's pre-COVID, just by the way. But Murray goes even further in this film. He refers to the supermarket as a place that recharges us spiritually. It's a gateway. Look how bright. Look how full of psychic data, waves, and radiation. All the letters and numbers are here. All the colors of the spectrum, all the voices and sounds, all the code words and ceremonial phrases. We just have to know how to decipher it. We just have to know how to decipher it, Murray says. 
Have you looked around your grocery store lately? Because he's not wrong. All the code words are there. All these things that make us feel good and healthy and like we're making smart decisions for ourselves. Words like natural, healthy, fresh, guaranteed, trusted, whole, source. These signs and symbols may blend into the background and only get picked up by your subconscious, but grocery stores are designed to make you feel like you're taking great care of yourself by shopping there. I mean, the rest of the world outside might be a gray, drab, rain-soaked, creeping nightmare in slow motion, but duck into a grocery store and it's like walking into a symmetrically arranged technicolored dream. Marketers and psychologists obviously had a romantic dinner on that one a long time ago. I mean, even the characters on the cereal boxes have been specially designed to make eye contact with your children. The grocery store is an incredibly psychological place. I mean, it's one of our basic necessities to live. Food. That we get there. Most people have an idea in their minds that is activated by seeing the word natural or the word fresh. Right? These words elicit emotions in us, even if only subconsciously. The film never connects the fact that tractor trailers and trains and industrial processes, so deadly when they collide and explode and burn, are also what supplies our grocery stores. Most don't really think about where the food supply comes from and how it gets transported to the store so they can buy it. There's a purposeful disconnect in the chain there. So at one end, something so deadly that could kill us is also life-sustaining and feeds us. There's an ever-present undercurrent of fear that inherently exists in human awareness. And in this society, it's so present and prevalent, we don't really, it's almost like we just can't even deal with it. The film features an experimental psychopharmaceutical medication that's supposed to take away one's fear of death, which is the ultimate thing. I mean, if they can't cure death, that would be the next thing, right? To cure people's fear of it. A side effect of this drug is not being able to distinguish words from things. I could not distinguish words from things so that if someone said speeding bullet, I'd fall for a take So if someone said something like speeding bullet, a person taking this drug might die for cover, mistaking the words for the actual thing itself in their mind. And so the final part of the movie focuses heavily on a situation regarding Jack and Babette and this drug. And that's the part that really, really hit me. I mean, this whole movie hits. If you, if you actually take the time to listen to what's being said here and presented here, it's a really striking film what they're talking about but this part I feel like I just saw that over the past three years I saw some people reacting to things they can't see or feel because they heard words about those things and took those words in place of the actual thing itself and then reacted as if the word was the thing and in, there's, there's this really crazy scene at the end dan of everyone dancing in the grocery store that really just reminded me so much of Omega Mart. But that's, that's, a, whole, that's a whole different video, so. But I think that it kind of goes to show that kind of the human condition, we're the same people, <laughs> different generations, different eras, and we're always kind of fighting against the, the powers as far as like, you know, the everyday working class person and trying to just, you know, juggle the idea of how serious is this, this situation and yeah. what level do I need to kind of uh, react to it. And you can kind of feel that from the film. In an era of television programming, we've been taught to verify our wider reality through mainstream media legitimization. If a tree falls in the forest and no one's there to film it and run that footage on the six o'clock news, did it really happen? How do we know that it happened? So 
The mainstream media as a business model has always relied on a sort of built-in trust factor. After all, you weren't there to see an event go down yourself, so you watch it on the news. And that's how you know. And if the news doesn't report on it, and you just hear about it, I mean, do you, do you not try to verify it in some other way? Like, oh, well, did the news talk about it? Because that's the way everyone's been trained to, to perceive reality now in this television era. Back in the day when there were only three television stations to choose from, people generally believed what they were shown as if it was fact without question. In this way, generations have now been trained to not only think about what the media talks about, but to think what the media tells them to about those things. But as time has gone on, technology's gotten more sophisticated, and it feels as though everything's been inverted. You may have noticed in recent years with the hyperpolarization of everything, major events no longer shape the narrative that's told about them, but rather it seems the narrative is actually shaping the event at this point. The evidence, the event, the thing, whatever is being reported on, instead of standing on its own for whatever it is, it's now twisted to fit whatever the wider narrative is, when it really should be the other way around. Again, these shouldn't be partisan events. A lot of these things that have been turned into partisan events, they're not. There's nothing about them that should be. Worse than that, though, is it seems as though some people are now post-COVID completely unable to recognize any of this, even when it's happening to them, even when they follow a media event, then follow another one, and, and they're contradictory, and the whole thing contradicts itself, and they just run with these contradictions, even though it should stop them, and they should wonder, why is that? Richard Grove recently shared the phrase paradigm blindness, which I actually had never heard before. But from what I can tell, it's what happens when people are conditioned to view an event in one specific way, and no matter what new information is revealed to them, they can't see it any other way than that which they have been conditioned. Which, if that's a thing, goes a long way to explaining some of the phenomena we've seen where something comes out and depending on which side the person's political bias lies, which mainstream media they've been consuming, they automatically make that thing fit into a preconceived notion which they've previously been provided with. In this way, we can have one event with what should be one set of basic facts, right? But, but depending on who is perceiving that event, it's like it happened on two totally different planets, and those planets barely overlap at all. Which is something I'm going to start referring to as synthetic multiverse effect when totally different narratives are scripted over the same piece of evidence, driving people into completely different realities from each other based upon which narrative the person follows. Not the evidence, not the thing itself, the narrative, the storyline. And these storylines have gotten so powerful that even when new information comes out that contradicts that storyline, that narrative, it doesn't seem to matter. That's the blindness. And I, I wonder... Personally, if the fear induced in the last few years is what broke some people in this way, in their mind. And I'm one of those, no one's going to want to hear what I have to say, but I guess I'll say it anyway because somebody has to kind of people. I've been that way my whole life. And it's a super fun life of the messenger getting shot continuously forever. But what we have in this situation is a consequence of outsourcing the responsibility for ourselves, for our minds, for our brains, for our perceptions of reality, the outsourcing of ourselves to all these other entities that are not ourselves. We outsource our intuition, outsourcing the ability to think, outsourcing the responsibility for our own selves to so many other people and institutions that are not us. 
And society programs us to do this from the time we're quite small, and it's clearly never expected to end our whole entire lives. I mean, there are a lot of things in this world that can make you feel fear, but no one can face that fear down and overcome it for you, except for yourself. You can't, if you don't feel safe, no one else can really make you do that. They can give you information that you can weigh against yourself and see, like, does this help me to feel safe? But no one else is going to be able to feel safe for you or take away your fear except for you. People who are in Ohio right now who feel scared that their water and air is not as clean as what they've been told should probably listen to the danger signals coming from within themselves before outsourcing that God-given intuition to other people who are not them. If, if you are in a situation and you do not feel safe deep down, no one else reassuring you is going to be able to trump your own inner voice and make you feel safe. You can allow someone else to trump yourself, but you're overriding yourself. If you don't feel safe, leave. You need to listen to yourself. You need to listen to your own inner voice and you need to get the hell out of there. I, my heart, I cried. I cried over these reports. I, this is part of the reason I don't like to do reports on news. I get way too emotional about these things because I've seen it so many times at this point. People getting hurt, people being lied to over and over and over. And it just doesn't change. It's the same thing on a loop. Like we just don't, as a society, learn. <laughs> if we want to take back control of our lives from fear, we have to start by taking back the power words have over us. Are we reacting to an actual thing that's actually occurring right now within our physical person? Or are we reacting to a word via a program that has been imparted so that we will react to these words in these ways. Which is it? Are we reacting to the words or are we reacting to the actual things that the words are describing? Because there's a difference there and it's a huge difference. We have to stop allowing the white noise of living in a society being techno driven from one crisis to another without end to drown out our own selves. Anyway, I love you guys.